Lord, open our lips and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. We say together the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what is right, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for mercy shall be shown to them. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted in the cause of right, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. And now the collect for today. God of love, in your compassion, you reach out to the lost and the helpless. Continue this work through us so that your reign of justice and peace may increase through Jesus Christ, the Lord of the harvest. Amen. A reading from Romans chapter 5. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, set us right with him, makes us fit for him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And it's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his door to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our prayers. There's more to come. We continue to shout our praise even when you're hemmed in with troubles, because we know how troubles can develop passionate patience within us, and how that patience in turn forges the tempered steel of a virtue, keeping us alert for whatever God will do next. In alert expectancy such as this, we are never left feeling shortchanged. Quite the contrary, we can't round up enough containers to hold everything God generously pours into our lives through the Holy Spirit. Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. We can understand someone dying for a person worth dying for, and we can understand how someone good and noble could inspire us to selfless sacrifice. But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death, while we were of no use whatever to him. Now that we are set right with God by means of his sacrificial death, the consummate blood sacrifice, there is no longer a question of being at odds with God in any way. If we were at our worst, we were put on friendly terms with God by the sacrificial death of his son. Now that we're at our best, just think of how our lives will expand and deepen by means of his resurrection life. Now that we have actually received this amazing friendship with God, we are no longer content to simply say it is plodding prose. We sing and shout our praises to God through Jesus, the Messiah. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, I have been sitting on this couch for three months wearing the same outfit. And the only thing that's changed is that my hair is longer. So today I want to try something just a little bit different. So if you have a Bible handy, you might want to hit pause and go and grab it. You might find it easier to follow along with the Bible in your hands. If not, don't worry about it. Uh, just don't hit delete. Our, our reading from Romans today, at, at first blush, is, is almost annoying. At first blush, it sort of sounds like Paul is saying, you know, when, when your heart's broken, when everything's terrible, when life is collapsing all around you, hey, it's going to make you a better person. Cheer up, you know, it's, it, it, it's going to make you stronger. You're going to be better for it. Well, if he was my therapist, I'd be looking for a different therapist. You know? Don't tell me that it's good for me to brag because my heart's aching. Don't tell me that. We, we need to look at it, I think, a, a, a little bit deeper. And I have been, uh, I have really been influenced recently by the work of E.P. Sanders, a theologian named Horsley and N.T. Wright, and the work that they've done talking about a new perspective in looking at Paul. Uh, the new perspective is looking at Paul's writings from a political point of view. Um, the old perspective was a spiritual point of view. Uh, personally, I don't think it's either or. I think it has to be both and. But, but let's start by taking a look at this. We need to understand that, oh, going back to the 6th century, or 6 BC, uh, on a government building in Asia Minor, chiseled in, into the granite, was an inscription about the emperor that, that said that Caesar was divine. God manifest the beginning of good news for the world. By the time Paul was writing this letter, the fastest growing religion in the Mediterranean region was the imperial cult or the Caesar cult. Uh, Caesar was given names like Lord of the world, son of God, savior, prince of peace. The term gospel, good news, which the church appropriated was used by, by the Romans to describe Caesar. When, when, when an emperor was born, the, the good news, the euangelion, the gospel, was proclaimed that a new emperor was born. When, when, when he ascended to the throne, the good news, the euangelion, the gospel, what, what was proclaimed to all of the empire that Caesar had taken the throne. When, when, when another country was conquered, the good news was written on parchment that were called evangels and, and taken around and, and the good news was shared with everyone. And, and when Caesar would get off of his throne and go and visit one of his conquered countries, that trip, that visit was referred to as the parousia, a word that Christians later adopted to describe the second coming of Christ. With that kind of background, with the, with the understanding that, that Roman imperial theology was the ideological core of Roman power, it was the heart, the heart of Roman rule. Understanding that, listen to how Paul begins his letter to the Romans. T turn to chapter one, if you have a Bible, and listen to how he starts. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, listen to this, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel, the good news concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God with power 
according to the spirit of holiness, by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, Jesus the King, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for the sake of his name including yourselves who were called to belong to Jesus Christ. Do you hear? Do you hear what Paul is doing? Paul understands, understands the gospel to be about the fact that the kingdom of God is about to replace the kingdom of Caesar, that the death and resurrection of Jesus was like a new genesis, a new creation. Humanity was being given a second chance, a chance to start over and to get it right. But listen, to, to claim that Jesus was the son of God, to speak of Jesus as Lord, to speak of Jesus as Savior, and, and then to back it up by talking about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead after the Roman military, Caesar's killing machine, had put him to death. Well, it asks the question, which God is really in charge? The God of violence, or the God of love and justice? Who's in charge, really? Well, to ask that question publicly, to proclaim that gospel under the very patrician nose of Caesar, to forge a community committed to following in the way of Jesus, to set themselves out to draw in the Gentiles into the way, into belief in Jesus, into a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was paramount to treason. You could not simply march into Rome and say to Caesar and the Roman authorities in the very center of the city, there's a new sheriff in town and expect to get away with it. And that's precisely what Paul does in his letter. And, and we need to understand that this letter of Paul to the Romans, it, it wasn't a private email. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a text message. It was more like Twitter. It would be read publicly again and again and again in groups small and large, and they would be, it would be liked by a lot of people. But you need to know the Roman authorities, they would unfriend Paul in a hurry. This kind of message could only, only lead to suffering. And Paul understood that for the embryonic Christian community in Rome, who were already struggling, who were already becoming enemies of the state, that the more they preached, the more they proclaimed, the more they did the work of being the church, the harder it was going to be for them. So Paul writes this letter to do two things. One, to challenge, to challenge Caesar, and the other is to give hope and to give courage and to give strength to this community. So listen again to the words that he says. He says, therefore, since we are justified by faith. Now that's often read as we are justified by our own faith. Personally, I think that's a bit cheeky. And I think that if we read this, I think that what Paul is saying here is that since we are justified by the faithful response of Jesus, by the faithful response that put him on the cross, by the faithful response that led to his crucifixion and resurrection, since we are, are justified by his faithful response, we have found peace, tranquility, comfort, wellness with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to grace. And, and then he goes on to talk about the fact, and this is the way I think we need to, to, to interpret this business about boasting in, in our suffering. He's saying to them, listen, and he, and he talks to the plural, plural. He's not saying you. He's saying we, us, in our ministry, we are going to encounter struggles. We are going to encounter sufferings. But if we stand together hand in hand, if we work together, support one another hand in hand, we will find resilience. We will find strength. We will find confident assurance, a better way to interpret boast. We will find confident assurance in the hope that Jesus has redeemed the world and given us a second chance. And that all of this, this stuff of Caesar and oppression and pain and suffering is gonna to come to an end. We have confident assurance, we have hope and hope will not disappoint us. And, and then he goes on, just in case folks haven't got that message, he goes on a bit later on to say, if one man's trespass, Adam's, uh, if because of that, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Put another way, the way we say it in our burial service, for as in Adam all died, even so in Christ shall all be made to live. Paul is talking about this Christ event as the new Genesis, the second chance, a recreation. And, and now listen again to the words that he speaks in chapter eight, words that he's speaking to this community that are living between times, between the resurrection and between, between the kingdom of God being fully realized, a community that are suffering for their faith. And, and, and Paul says these words to them. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not withhold his son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who's going to bring a charge against us? It's God who justifies. Who's going to condemn us? It's Christ Jesus who died and who was raised who's at the right hand of God, who is interceding for us. And now listen to this. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, in King Jesus, our Lord. Incredible words of hope, incredible words of comfort to a struggling, hurting, suffering community. Well, listen, that's lovely for them, but we need to understand that you and I, we, we are a people living in the between times as well. We are living between the resurrection and the kingdom of God being fully realized. And, and if ever we had forgotten that, these last few months have made it pretty clear. We have witnessed sickness and suffering and death locally, nationally, and globally. We have witnessed the tug of war between political systems and domination cultures and systems. We have witnessed violence and depression and anguish and fear resulting from systemic racism. We have looked over the last three months and wondered what is happening to our world. And, and I need to say, I believe that we need, we need to listen to Romans 5 and to Romans 8. We need to listen to a, a word of hope for all of creation. We need to listen to a word of hope for our world, a word of hope for our, our people of faith, for the church, and a word of hope for us 
as individuals. And, and I believe that the message that Paul has for us today, far from being a message about suffering is gonna just make you better, I think it's a message that with everything that we see going on around us, there are problems, there is pain, there is suffering, there is stuff that needs to get fixed. But as people of faith, if we stand together, hand in hand, if we support one another and strengthen one another, we can find the confident assurance necessary to address the systems and structures which are hurting so many, many people. We can find the courage to listen, to really listen to one another. We can find the courage to have real conversations with one another. And that is critical for us at this point. And at a personal level, I don't know about you, but I know for me that I have those times, usually it's when I'm lying in bed, that the stuff that's going on in the world begins to get on my nerves. When the problems that I read about and the things I see on the news become incredibly distressing, or sometimes for me, uh, memories of pains of the past, for some reason unbidden come flooding back. Whatever the situation is, that happens for most of us at one time or another. And those are the moments I believe that we need to listen to the words of Paul in chapter eight. When you are lying in the darkness, when, when your heart is somehow broken, when you are uncertain, when you are frightened, when life is just beginning to feel like it is too much for you, listen to these words, I am convinced, absolutely convinced that neither death nor life angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You and I, we are held together in that holy embrace. We are held in the arms of a God who will not let us go, not now, not ever. And, and we claim again again and again, the message of Easter, which says death is not the end, life is, and this is God's world, not Caesar's. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen.
And now we say together, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Let us pray. God ever creating, God ever loving, God ever leading, we turn to you in uncertain times, trusting in your steadfast love. Wherever people are anxious about the future, overwhelmed by their responsibilities, or worried because of the upheavals the pandemic has caused, bring peace and hope, we pray, and let your kingdom come. God of all compassion, where people are lonely or isolated, longing for love, where people are trapped in unhealthy relationships or facing violence each day, where people are grieving the loss of routines or purpose in their lives or the loss of someone beloved. Bring courage and hope, we pray, and let your kingdom come. God of tender strength, where people feel pain in their bodies, in their minds or spirits, where people seek healing or help, where illness has eroded hope and desperation fills each day. Bring healing and hope, we pray, and let your kingdom come. Where leaders work to guide the world, and their communities to renewed life, where professionals discern scientific, medical, and economic insights to protect and restore the quality of life after the pandemic, where individuals still strive to care for the earth and its vulnerable inhabitants. Bring wisdom and hope, we pray and let your kingdom come. God in whom we live and move and have our being, by your Spirit, tend your promise of new life amid the current struggles in the world you love, where hope flickers, reignite its power. Shine the light of Christ's love into each life and renew our trust in you we pray, and let your kingdom come. And now, gathering our prayers and praises together, we pray in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those whom you love and pray for today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.
Jesus.